Louisiana Eats is brought to you with support from Louisiana Fish Fry, a staple of Louisiana kitchens for nearly 40 years. Maker of batters, coatings, boils, tartar sauce, cocktail sauce, and more. Dig into homemade Louisiana flavor. From our studios in the Southern Food and Beverage Museum in New Orleans, this is Louisiana Eats. I'm Poppy Tooker, hosting from my home studio. For the last three weeks, we've been reporting on the COVID-19 pandemic situation here in our home base of New Orleans, one of the worst hit cities in the U.S. This week, we're taking a virtual trip outside of our quarantine zone to learn what's happening both around the state and the nation. We speak with Justin Girard, four-time James Beard semifinalist from his restaurant, The French Press in Lafayette. Justin and his wife, Margaret, are sole survivors of the French press's COVID layoffs, the only way they could see to try and keep the French press alive in these desperate times. We'll learn about their daunting schedule providing breakfast and lunch takeout in downtown Lafayette. Then we check in with Chris J. in Shreveport. Chris shares the inspiring stories of our food friends to the north who are standing strong despite the unknown. We get an update from Seattle, Washington, the original U.S. epicenter of the disease, and we'll hear how two New Orleanians completely reinvented their hospitality company to help service an immediate need in healthcare, keeping many of their original employees employed. We're checking on old friends and getting a big boost of inspiration on this week's Louisiana Eats. Hi, I'm Emery Whalen. I'm the CEO of QED Hospitality. And I am Brian Landry, Emery's partner and the chef of QED Hospitality. We begin our program with the story of two business partners who were able to change gears after the coronavirus shuttered their hospitality company. They managed to both keep employees on the payroll and meet a growing need in their community. I've long been a fan of this dynamic duo, Emery Whalen and Chef Brian Landry. I've known them for many years and have enjoyed watching their meteoric rise in the industry. In 2018, Emery and Brian created QED Hospitality to manage food and beverage operations at the Pontchartrain Hotel in New Orleans and the Thompson Hotel in Nashville. When gathering spaces were ordered to close across the state, Emery and Brian realized they'd have to close their eight food and beverage outlets as offering takeout and delivery wasn't a plausible model to keep their employees working. That's when Emery got word from her brother, Ralph Whalen, that workers were urgently needed in the growing field of telehealth. I asked Emery and Brian to pick up the story from there. Here's Emery. So this actually came about because my brother is a senior vice president at a medical technology consulting company called Divergent. He was in the middle of scaling up for a really large project that involves staffing customer service representatives for a telemedicine hotline. Telemedicine is something where we're doing exactly what you and I are doing right now, Poppy. We're talking over some form of virtual communication and patients can communicate with their doctors that way. And they needed people to call these patients and offer them the opportunity to change their in-person visit to a telemedicine visit, walk them through the technology and how to get set up and just generally make people feel more comfortable with the process. They were in the middle of this big scale up and we were in the middle of figuring out what in the world we could do with all of the people that worked for us. And my brother, you know, he said, there is an opportunity where your people can actually be put to work doing these telemedicine phone calls. And we figured out how to have his company, Divergent, hire QED and we made a whole new company. It's called QED Resources. We made a whole new company in order to have all of our employees stay on that wanted to stay on with us 
and take this opportunity to work in telemedicine. So bartenders and sous chefs and runners are all now manning the phone lines for a telemedicine hotline. How many people are involved actually who have done this transition from hospitality into telemed? Over a hundred. How are y'all handling these financials? Because so you formed a new company. So I'm guessing that your old employees are still your employees ultimately. That is the beauty of what we did with Divergent. They hired QED so that we could keep our employees employed and they have continuity in healthcare coverage. They get their checks the same way. They still get their direct deposits just like they used to. Nothing changed for them when it comes to how they get paid. The pay is actually pretty darn great. Um, They're making, a lot of them are making comparable money, if not more in some cases. I think what's fascinating about this entire opportunity that Divergent provided to us is that it fits so many needs. The hospitality industry was closing, but hospitals are also in clearly the middle of the pandemic in that they are the first line of defense. And a lot of their resources are being stretched so thin. All of our employees are in a work from home situation providing a service to the hospital in that we are helping an enormous number of patients avoid an in-person hospital visit and an in-person doctor visit, which is helping not stretch the resources of the hospital so thin and providing work for currently out of work hospitality professionals. It still amazes us that Um, Divergent was willing to take that chance with us to say, let's see if this works. Walk me through how the employee selection and hiring and training went. How was the training conducted? All virtually. Um, (laughs) So part of our goal was to have continuity. And that meant continuity in pay, continuity in benefits. So if you had benefits with us, they would keep going. And that also meant that there was a real time pressure because we needed to get people up and running and trained and on the phones as soon as possible so that there was no gap in pay. And we told them about the opportunity on a Tuesday. And then by Friday, they had started training. And by Monday, they were ready to go. They have managed to master multiple healthcare software systems. We're just so proud of them. My goodness. I mean, there's got to be a little bit of a curve. I mean, sure, you know, you can pretty well guarantee that your bartenders and your servers are going to be pretty hospitable people accustomed to talking to folks, but back of the house, maybe not so much. (laughs) You'd be surprised. So that's one of the fascinating parts to all of this, I think. And I What we're finding is all of the people we work with picked hospitality as a career, whether they work in the front or the back, they are still working in service of other people. And they work really well together as a team. And we're finding sous chefs coaching runners and pastry chefs teaching cooks When you're in a restaurant, they talk about like the front of the house, back of the house divide. And then our normal lives in hospitality, we do a lot of work to make sure those lines are erased. But when they all started working in this new role as telehealth, you know, representatives, those lines disappeared for real. And we are seeing cooks and sous chefs and lots of people who work in the back of the house be just as proficient at this as people who are normally customer facing. And so I think it's been a blessing for our company to see how well our team functions together, even in this time of crisis. We're hearing from our people that how deeply grateful they are for the opportunity and to feel supported by us. 
Um, we always tell them we do anything for them, but I think we actually have an opportunity here to prove it. Yeah. We get emails with stories. Today, we got a message about um, a patient who was called by one of our managers, Caitlin, and the patient had just gotten off of a back-to-back ICU shift, and she'd been so busy. She was a nurse. She'd been so busy caring for other people, she didn't have time to do her doctor's visits. And she broke down crying on the phone and thanked Caitlin for what she was doing and how much of an impact it had on her and the lives of so many other people. And to be able to to have the opportunity to connect with people in the way that we once did over food and drink is, it's really, it's moving to hear the stories, but it's deeply gratifying. And I think gives everybody a continued sense of purpose. Are you worried you're going to lose some of them when all this is over? Nah. Um, (laughs) I think so many people got into hospitality because they crave that that social interaction. And while this is an amazing way to provide opportunity for our employees, while we don't have bars and restaurants, I believe quite firmly that when we do have bars and restaurants again, they're all going to come right back and they're going to come back with such a stronger bond to, to us, to each other. Divergent clearly understands that we are hospitality workers first and foremost, and it is absolutely our desire to get back to our restaurants. As the curve is flattened and restaurants and bars do start reopening, we will have the opportunity to quickly tack back to being a hospitality company. Whether um, the telehealth services that we're now providing continue on, I think is still up in the air uh, and something we will explore if there's a need there and and some of our employees want to stay in that profession. But the far majority, if not like the 99% of the people we worked with before all of this started, absolutely want to get back into the restaurants and bars and coffee shops as do we. I can't wait until we can all have a a big toast again with that fabulous view up at the hot tin. Oh, what a happy day that'll be. Looking forward to it, Poppy. That was Emery Whalen and Brian Landry of QED Hospitality, and most recently, QED Resources. Coming up next, we talk with Justin Girard of the French Press in Lafayette to learn how his business is adapting to the coronavirus shutdown. Louisiana Eats returns after the break. Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is brought to you with major support from Camellia Brand, Beans Done Right, a New Orleans tradition since 1923, and from the Ralph Brennan Restaurant Group. Ralph's on the Park on City Park Avenue in Mid-City is open and offering family-style dinners Wednesday through Sunday for curbside pickup. There's a different theme each night of the week. To learn more, visit ralphsonthepark.com or reach them directly at 504-488-1000. the coronavirus crisis, folks statewide are stepping up to help their communities through food. Is there an individual, group, or organization that's making a difference to you or your community? Give these COVID culinary heroes a shout out 
by tagging us on social media or leaving us a message on our phone line. We may share your story on a future program. We can be reached at 504-264-3149. 504-264-3149. And now, back to Louisiana Eats. My name is Justin Gerard. I'm the chef restaurateur of the French Press in Lafayette, Louisiana. On New Year's Eve in 2009, Chef Justin Gerard and his wife Margaret opened the French Press in a former printing press in downtown Lafayette. Blending new American cuisine with a Cajun twist, the French Press offered Lafayette diners a new experience, somewhere between fine dining and the comfort of the famous Acadiana plate lunch. Within a couple of years, the restaurant was a darling of the national press, with lines around the block for Saturday and Sunday brunch. Two years later, Justin was nominated for Best Chef of the South by the James Beard Foundation. The French press has remained a single owner operator establishment and the COVID-19 shutdown has hit them hard. All employees full and part-time were laid off, leaving Justin and Margaret as sole operators of the business. When I caught up with Justin, he and Margaret had just returned from another long day of breakfast and lunch takeout. Justin, Let's talk a little bit about how this COVID-19 crisis has impacted the French press and how you have adjusted to this impact. Yeah, um, adjusting to this impact. (laughs) I mean, every day is just as crazy as the last. And we've just made our 10-year anniversary, and this is by far the most difficult thing we've ever had to do. And I could never have imagined having to go through this it really just was a blind side you hear about the virus in the news you hear about it being in china and that kind of isn't that uncommon in this day and age you know so i kind of wasn't paying too close attention to it but the thing that got my attention was the travel ban for the european countries that president trump enacted and i thought to myself oh man this is this is getting more serious you know maybe it's going to affect the business maybe we should actually come up with a plan. And then the next thing that happened was the school closures. And it kind of got really crazy at that point, because then you're starting to worry about your personal life too. What am I going to do with my kids? You know, what's that going to look like for our customers' lives? How's that going to affect their dining habits? How's that going to affect our business? And then sure enough, two days later, here we are closing our dining room. We go from everybody coming to work Monday, having a relatively normal day to me calling everybody that night and saying, hey, you're out of a job. Mm. until further notice. And I mean, that's just gut-wrenching to have to do that, you know. How many employees were involved? We have 18 total, full-time and part-time. And now we're down to just Margaret and I. My goodness. Yeah, you and Margaret and two small children. How old are your children? Well, they're, they're 13 and 11. So not that small, but still small enough to where they need their mom and dad, you know, so navigating that is a whole nother thing. So how are you and Margaret managing? Uh, it, you know, it's tough and we're just trying to do what we can. We're doing curbside and takeout and we're, um, we're still just kind of trying different things here and there. It seems to be like restaurants that were already known as are already set up to do takeout and delivery and especially drive through. Are, are the ones that are doing any kind of business. And some of them are actually seeming to be doing more business. Changing what people have known you as for 10 years is really difficult to do, especially in the course of two weeks. So of course, we're out there on social media, we're out there uh, on our email list, letting people know that we're still here and we're doing takeout and drive-through and or curbside is, is what it's called. But it's difficult, you know? And so that's our challenge is how do we stay in people in the four foreign people's minds when they think about what they want to eat for breakfast and lunch. And, you know, breakfast to begin with is not a very common takeout or delivered meal. Right. So there's that challenge too, but the support has, has been there from 
a bunch of different directions. The city, the downtown development has been a resource for restaurants. They've been communicating all these different um, programs from small business grants to federal aid to even just offering to physically come down and, and help out, you know? So, so there is a lot of community response and effort to help, you know, the, the community support, a lot of our locals are there. They're in, they're curious too. They want to know what we're doing and they want to make sure that we're okay. And, and that's, that's comforting. And that's what we need right now. That's what every locally small owned restaurant needs is the community support. That's the most important thing. One of the interesting things about the French press is that before you all opened 10 years ago, downtown Lafayette wasn't necessarily known for their dining scene. As a matter of fact, it was a little quiet to say the least down there. But because the French press was so successful, you really helped lead a revitalization of the area and dozens of restaurants open and now the Advocate has reported half the restaurants in downtown Lafayette have closed since the COVID-19 outbreak. What are you seeing in downtown Lafayette and across the Lafayette area? Lafayette downtown is a commuter downtown. We don't have too much of a permanent residence population. So the fact that a lot of people aren't working and only essential businesses are are going to to work right now or have any 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 of their employees coming in downtown's pretty dead it's pretty empty and that's scary to see you know when you when you're driving up to work and there's parking anywhere and everywhere you know that's rare and just nobody walking around and i'm sure a lot of people are seeing that in all different parts of the in the country and so it kind of hits you mm. makes you realize like how serious it is and how big it goes but the other struggle is that you know because the way Lafayette is laid out downtown is there's not, you, you don't, if you're, if you're going downtown, it's cause you're going downtown. You don't drive through downtown to get from point A to point B. So, you know, we're not getting very much traffic at all. And, and like I said, some of the other places around town that I've seen seem to have more business are the ones on the major thoroughfares that have set up for drive through. A lot of the um, daiquiri shops have been really busy lately. So I don't know how to compete with that. <laughs> How many days are you operating weekly? We're we're in there every day but Monday. And there's just so much to do with these loans and these federal aid programs, you know, gathering all the information, filling out all the applications, getting everything. You know, we don't we don't have any of our staff, so we got to cook, clean, take out the trash, do all that. Um, you know, all the staff is doing all their unemployment benefits. And so there's all kind of new responsibilities coming in every day. So it's hard to think beyond the end of today, <laughs> you know, as yeah. far as food goes, because it is perishable. That is something you have to consider. I mean, we're two, three days at a time and I, I'm not able to meet the big, you know, order minimums that most purveyors have to require. So we're doing things like grocery delivery that a lot of residential orders are doing, you know, but my orders are small enough to where, Usually that wouldn't make sense for us to do something like that, but right now it does. So it's a whole different world. It's just a whole different thing. Justin, how in the world are you all separating business, worry, work, and home? And what are you all doing for self-care and a little R&R &R in with this six day a week operation and everything else you're doing? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about that yet. We're, I mean, it's still so new, but it is, you know, it is important and it's something that we've discussed. Uh, um, we haven't quite established what that schedule is. And there's been some tense moments where it's like, okay, we, you know, we either need a break from the restaurant or we might need a break from each other. But after working with each other for 10 years, we've kind of learned how to get through, you know, tough periods. My kids, Fortunately, we have the resource of my parents who live outside of Lafayette a little bit. And so from day one, we, we well, when school was canceled, they came to stay out here with them. But as everybody became more concerned about actually transmitting coronavirus or getting coronavirus, and my parents are both at risk age, we didn't, the last thing we could do is bring the kids back to our house where we're interacting with the public and then transmit coronavirus to them and then them bring it out here. So they've been 
quarantine with my parents out in in Maurice. That's our big goal is to is to get to where we can go and and visit them. So we've established this like barricade of tables across the middle of the dining room. And whenever we prepare the to-go orders, we get everything packed up and ready. And we, we, you know, we do the credit card transaction over the phone and we'll go and put the orders on those tables so that basically people coming in to get their food stay tens of feet away from us at least so that we're not coming in contact with anybody to take it very seriously so that our, our goal is to finally get out to uh, go hang out with our kids again. So yeah, it's, it's, it's time for some R and R, but unfortunately there hasn't been a feeling of, of relief yet. Nobody's received the EDIL $10,000 grant that was part of that application that was, you know, I, I expect that some of that money be paid out pretty quickly. So I think maybe when some of that relief, that financial relief comes, then some people will be able to relax a little bit. Justin, six months from now, what do you think the Lafayette food scene is going to be like? Well, hopefully it'll be back to normal. You know, it would be great to, to pick up right where we left off. And the optimist in me sees that, but I also am living the struggle. And I, I totally understand that, that this is probably going to be too difficult for some people to make it through. You know, I, I wonder every day if we're going to make it through. It's just such a daunting task. But no matter how much federal assistance or government assistance we get, none of that matters if the community doesn't come together to to support local businesses and local restaurants. And, you know, we have that here. You guys have that in New Orleans. Food cities have that all over the country. And that's what's going to be the most important thing. And I can't stress that enough. Whenever people ask, like, what can I do? I said, just order food tomorrow. You know, thank you for your order today. Please order again tomorrow or the next day. It's just like when you have a major personal tragedy, you know, right in the very beginning is when you receive the most help, but it's going to be a long fight. So don't, don't just support your local restaurants over the next week or two weeks. It's going to be six months, a year, a year and a half. It's going to be a long time before things get back to normal. That was Chef Justin Gerard of the French Press in downtown Lafayette, Louisiana. Chris J. I live in Shreveport, Louisiana with my wife, Sarah, and she and I write a newsletter about local food and drink called Stuffed and Busted. For nearly a decade, our old friend and roving reporter, Chris J., has kept us in the know on the food scene in northwestern Louisiana. We gave Chris a call to learn how our culinary friends in the shreveport Bossier area are coping with the COVID-19 pandemic. In the broadest strokes, um, many of the mom and pops uh, that have been trying to pivot to takeout and curbside have found that process either frustrating or, or just downright impossible as far as making the money that they need to stay in business. So right now, a lot of the mom and pops in Shreveport Bossier that you may have heard of, places like Herbie K's and Fertitas Delicatessen, that don't have that ability to pivot they have shut down temporarily. And of course, everyone's worried sick about all of these beloved institutions, but it, it was asking a lot to ask them to completely change their business model, you know, and some were able to adjust and hang on for a while and others found it easier and more appealing just to shut down and let this thing blow over. The one thing that I find particularly kind of vexing is that a lot of our restaurateurs here are older. Um, you know, I think about my friend Harvey Clay, who runs Real Barbecue and More. He's 72. And so it's going to be hard for him to, to suddenly reinvent his business as a social media based delivery business. You know what I mean? And it's equally challenging for him, I think, to work his way through the CARES Act. Uh, I spoke with him about it and, and it, it's, a, it's, it's a lot there to digest. So I think some of our older restaurateurs in particular, I'm really worried about. The CARES Act, of course, is the financial aid available. Yes. 
and I think maybe unfairly has been uh, perceived by many restaurateurs as nothing but an opportunity to take out a loan. I'm sure there's more to it. I'm sure there's more in that package, but a lot of my friends in the restaurant industry that I talk to, they say, I can't take on more loans. I, I, loans are not what I need right now. And so I believe that there's definitely some educational work to be done with the government relief programs. Well, I'm finding that um, it's the people with the creativity and the drive who are somehow retooling and reinventing. What are you seeing along those lines? I, I definitely agree that the folks who have that energy and that drive can stay open in the face of this adversity. I'm thinking about a place like Lucky Palace, which is kind of thriving right now because they have this James Beard Award nominated uh, wine list that they will deliver to your house. Cool. So you can get like vintage champagne from tiny allocation grower champagne from all over, you know, these bizarre regions of France. And you can get them delivered to your house with an order of General So's chicken. <laughs> A silver lining in every dark cloud. There is uh, definitely a silver lining. Tell me some other success stories. Oh my gosh, Poppy. The, the thing that made me just sincerely cry, um, there is a gentleman that works in the, the brewery, Great Raft Brewing here. It's a popular brewery. They've got it. They're distributing it in New Orleans now and all over Louisiana. We love Great Raft. After all, they've been featured in the past on Louisiana Eats. I love them more now than ever. Their tap room manager is a young man named Bob who collects uh, bourbon. And he went online one day and set up a raffle for a box of Kleenex tissue and its contents. And I'm using air quotes here because the contents were rare bottles of bourbon. <laughs> and for $1, you could get a raffle ticket. His goal was to raise $500 for friends who were out of work bartenders. Yesterday, as we're recording this, he passed $10,000 raised in $1 raffle ticket sales. Bob's never going to be able to pay for a meal or a drink again. Everyone here in Shreveport is just over the moon that a young man could set out to raise 500 bucks on his Facebook page and bring in $10,000 for the service industry. We're all so proud of him. That's fabulous. Who else? Tell us about some of our other friends. One thing that has struck me is that even when restaurateurs' backs are against the wall, because of the kinds of folks they are, their first impulse is to help others still. You know what I mean? And I think about um, a group like Bojack's Craft House, which is kind of a Creole and Cajun restaurant in Bossier City that has been feeding first responders literally since um, COVID-19 arrived in our community. They've been doing a GoFundMe to pay for the effort. They kind of have shut down, not shut down, but they're, they're still doing delivery, but they're not focusing on their restaurant right now. They're focusing on giant batches of meals that they can deliver to hospitals, to senior facilities. And that's just one example, but there are dozens like that. There's actually kind of an ad hoc group of them called 318 Eats, and they are delivering food from restaurants all over the community to hospitals and other places where, you know, the folks who are working there may have been on the clock for 18 hours and, and really need a meal. If anybody would like to find any of these links to help out where can people find out about this? You know, that's that's one of the frustrating challenges is we, we don't have a, a so much of a central node right now um, for all of these different places that you can take part. But what I would encourage you to do, and this is going to sound self-serving, but if you can look up Stuffed and Busted on Facebook, we're sharing all of the different GoFundMes, all of the different campaigns, we, anything we come across that's about food and, and fighting all the kind of desperation that we see setting in, uh, we're sharing it. So if it's a grant opportunity or a chance to contribute to GoFundMe, we're sharing it. One of the things that's been particularly um, just wild about um, COVID-19 and the effect it's had on our local restaurant scene is it, it, it happened at a, at a time when I felt like we were absolutely having a renaissance in our local food community. Um, you know, we just had a Hawaiian restaurant open. We just had several incredible New Mexican restaurants open. Uh, ramen has exploded across town, like I'm sure happened in New Orleans about five years ago. That's usually when we get it, it's about five years after. But good things were happening. 
And that's right when uh, we got slammed with this. I heard from numerous restaurants that uh, January was, for example, one of their most profitable months ever. Uh, so uh, it was it was an odd time. But I feel that so many of these restaurants played it smart and they are going to be able to come back even maybe stronger as a result of this incredible challenge. Chris, thank you so much for staying in touch with us and giving us the scoop on our friends in North Louisiana. Let's catch up again soon, okay? I can't wait, Poppy. Thank you. That was Chris J. of Stuffed and Busted, an online newsletter about food and drink in North Louisiana. You can find them on their website, stuffedandbusted.com, as well as on our site, poppytooker.com. What is the difference between hyposmia and anosmia? And what do they have to do with COVID-19? Stay tuned, and we'll answer that question when we come right back. Poppy Tooker, and you're listening to Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. Louisiana Eats is brought to you with support from the St. Tammany Parish Tourist Commission. Located 40 minutes from New Orleans French Quarter, the North Shore's Tammany Taste features the chefs and farmers, brewers and bakers of St. Tammany Parish's culinary scene. Despite the restrictions currently underway due to the COVID-19 outbreak, you can still support North Shore restaurants and restaurants everywhere by ordering takeout when available and buying gift certificates as an investment in our restaurant's culinary future. Visit LouisianaNorthShore.com to discover more. Louisiana's North Shore, where New Orleans has come to play and get away for more than a century. Louisiana Eats is also brought to you by Louisiana Fish Fry, who want to help feed our friends and neighbors in this time of need. They're asking for video submissions of you, your kids, parents, grandparents, anyone singing a chorus of our state anthem, You Are My Sunshine. For every submission, Louisiana Fish Fry will donate 100 meals to a local food bank. All submissions will be combined into a community-driven video to share our Louisiana pride with the world. Head to Louisiana's Fish Fry Facebook page to learn more and help feed your fellow Louisianians. Here's this week's culinary quiz question, brought to you with support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen. What is the difference between hyposmia and anosmia, and what do they have to do with COVID-19? Hyposmia is a decreased sense of smell, while anosmia is when you have no sense of smell whatsoever. It's been widely reported that losing your sense of smell and taste may be symptoms of having sustained the novel coronavirus. While scientists are still debating this connection, studies have shown that up to 40% of people with other viral infections, like the common cold or the flu, experience temporary loss of scent. Your olfactory senses are hugely instrumental in your ability to taste. So if your ability to detect smells is affected, you're not going to have much of a sense of taste either. Doctors believe that these viruses can cause inflammation of the nerves in your nasal cavities, a condition that should abate as you recover. I'm Poppy Tooker. Here's to us all enjoying some delicious Louisiana Eats again in good health. Bye.
Seattle, Washington had one of the earliest outbreaks of COVID-19 in the U.S., which means its restaurant industry has been dealing with the crisis for longer than anywhere in Louisiana. To get a sense of how the city is faring, I reached out to my friend Susie Cantor. I've known Susie since we attended Madeline Kamen's professional culinary course together back in the mid-1980s. Despite geographic distances, we've stayed in touch over the years as Susie's career morphed from the front of the house to the back and through several restaurants she's owned and operated in the Seattle area. We spoke via Zoom. Well, I really wanted to talk with you, Susie, because theoretically you are ahead of us with this virus, although we discovered that interestingly, both of our state governments ordered the shutdown of the restaurants on the same date. Yes, though a few restaurant companies actually must have had some crystal balls or something because they closed before that and people were starting to get leery and we'd already gotten the instructions to not gather in groups of more than 50. So Ah. things were in motion before that. So, Susie, um, all the restaurants and bars were ordered shut down except for takeout only. What what remains open? Um, just restaurants that have been able to figure out how to provide takeout and delivery. More are coming online daily. And also, I discovered that all the pot shops, because pot is legal here are still open because apparently they're deemed essential services. (laughs) Oh yes. Along with those liquor stores, right? Right. (laughs) So Susie, tell us about some of your favorite restaurants and restaurant tours and how they have responded during this crisis. Wow. It's been heart opening to watch. There's been a cascade, a tsunami of love and heart and a lot of communication on social media um, from chefs. A group quickly got together on Facebook formed by just merely somebody who loves restaurants. And that's where there's 7,700 people now talking with each other on how to support each other during these times. Canless, a really iconic Seattle restaurant that's been around for, I think maybe this is the third generation. That would be sort of Seattle's answer to Antoine's, right? I think so. And they, like almost overnight, reinvented themselves and put together a breakfast service and then a lunch service. And they're live streaming their piano music, which is great because they're known for their piano bar and what a great thing to be able to live stream these days. Lisa Dupar, one of the finest caterers in town and has a fabulous restaurant, immediately started her takeout business with a very interesting feature and that is every order included a bottle of their cootie crushing spray hand sanitizer made according to the recipe of the CDC and the roll of toilet paper. (laughs) Um, And it looks like they're now selling their cootie crushing spray. And they've also expanded their offerings and you can get take and bake family meals as well. There's a restaurant called New, N-U-E, that's doing really clever cocktail kits. Really? They're doing partial bottles with vacuum sealed purees and everything you need to put together their fabulous recipes. I'm sure that um, there are all sorts of feeding efforts, etc., assistance to your hospitality industry going on. Could you highlight some of those efforts for us? Yes. So a lot of the restaurants that are offering takeout are also offering reduced meals 
reduced price meals or free meals to restaurant workers. And many, many, many restaurants are participating in feeding hospital workers, first responders, through another organization that's coordinating those efforts. Susie, what are larger corporations doing in this situation to help? Locally, what I really was in awe of was Howard Schultz of Starbucks started something called the Plate Fund. And they are providing very quick turnover gifts of $500 to people who've been laid off and are in between resources and could really use a quick gift like that. Susie, I know that in Seattle, much like in New Orleans, the homeless situation is staggering. What's what's up with that? It, it, it is here. It's unusually large. We, we have a gigantic homeless population, maybe because our weather is a little bit milder than most places. And a lot of our shelters have been closed because of the coronavirus. So we're in a real pickle to house people safely and also to feed them. And I was really inspired to hear about Tamara Murphy, Chef Tamara Murphy from Terra Plata, who quickly threw together Um, a food is love support system, and that is to feed the homeless encampments because people are just outside in tents. And she's committed to feeding as many people as possible through her restaurant. I truly believe that it is the people with the generous, good hearts and the quick, creative, inventive minds who are going to survive this thing, don't you? I do, I do. And people who stay in communication, just open your hearts. Greg Atkinson of Marche on Bainbridge Island is posting gorgeous pictures of the foods that he's making every single day for takeout and delivery that just keeps you in his heart and in your mind. And what he writes is just so beautiful. So, yes. Susie, it has been such a personal pleasure for me to get to spend this little time face-to-face with you on Zoom. Thanks for giving us this scoop on Seattle, and stay well and stay in touch. Thank you, Poppy. To you, too, and to all of New Orleans. Susie Cantor reporting in on how Seattle restaurants are coping with COVID-19. That's it for this week's edition of Louisiana Eats, edible content for Louisiana food lovers. If you're at loose ends these days, we have 10 years of Louisiana Eats editions available for pod and webcasting on poppytooker.com, along with recipes and videos, too. Louisiana Eats is made possible with major support from Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen, Louisiana Fish Fry, Camellia Brand Beans, and the St. Tammany Tourist Commission. Additional support for Louisiana Eats is provided by the Dickey Brennan and Company family of restaurants. Gift cards purchased now can be redeemed at Palace Cafe, Dickey Brennan Steakhouse, Bourbon House, Tableau, and Acorn. E-gift cards are available through all the restaurant's websites, as well as through FrenchQuarterDining.com. Please remember, during the COVID-19 crisis, restaurants need our support more than ever. Please consider takeout and delivery from our generous sponsors. And remember, buying a gift certificate is making an investment in their future. Original theme music composed by David Pomerlo and performed by Johnny Sketch and the Dirty Notes. Big thanks to senior producer Joe Schreiner and special projects manager Reggie Morris. And to our business manager and social media maven, Maddie Molladew. 
Catch up with us anytime on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, too. Louisiana Eats is a production of Poppy Tooker Broadcasting. Thank <laughs> you.